thank you so much for making time to talk to us today, Senator Linthicum. Um, we are hoping that you might be able to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for Secretary of State. You, you bet. Thank you for the opportunity. As you mentioned, uh, my name is Dennis Linthicum, and I am the state senator for District 28, which includes uh, northeastern Jackson County, all of Klamath, and the southern portion of the Chutes County um, before the last districting effort of a year ago. Uh, it also used to include all of Lake County and all of Crook County. So uh, I have served that large uh, geographic area for quite some time. And prior to that, I was a Klamath County commissioner. And so I think the main part of this question is what makes me um, uh, attracted to this position of Secretary of State. And first, I have a background as a train economist and um, being a former senior vice president of management information systems for a large insurance company. Um, I understand implementation requirements for large software projects. I've also been a for Oregon construction contractor licensee, a board member, and I'm currently a rancher deeply engaged in land management and sustainability issues. And this wide background means that I bring a wealth of technical and managerial expertise to the table. This positions me to help unlock the potentials of the individuals who are in the state office, as well as opportunities to bring positive outcomes to all Oregonians. Um, another little tidbit that your audience may be interested in is my wife and I have lived off the grid for 30 years. That means we do not have an electrical cable from the power pole coming to our home, uh, but rather we supply our own energy with solar panels and whatnot. And prior to becoming a state senator, I was the author, my, uh, my pen name was The Dirt Road Economist, because all of our uh, economic um, prosperity comes from a dirt road somewhere whether it's the studs in your wall, whether it's the drywall, whether it's the granite on your kitchen countertop, the kitchen cabinets themselves, everything originates off of a dirt road somewhere. And this makes Oregon a beautiful location for prosperity for the citizens within our boundaries, as well as unlocking the potential of our citizens at large. So this is a great opportunity for me to run for the Secretary of State's office because the Secretary of State, as you also know, is a land board member and a sustainability council member. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start off because you're, um, uh, you filed to run for Secretary of State fairly late uh, or, or really just shortly before the window for filing closed. Um, certainly you have been uh, in the state legislature for many years and the walkouts of last year and just kind of the, some of the legislation like uh, regarding that wrapped up um, in which uh, the both state and federal courts affirm that you can't run for reelection. Can you tell voters why they should um, believe that kind of running for Secretary of State is what you really want to do and that this is a good fit for you? Yeah, it, it, your question's an interesting question because for, first of all, uh, it, I'm assuming everybody knows what the denial of quorum is, but quite frankly, every time I speak to a crowd, they're not really sure. And the denial of quorum is, if, for example, homeowners were part of a homeowners association, an HOA as they're known, the homeowners association may require that your homes all be painted in a similar forest type of color scheme where there's appropriate greens and browns and tans and whatnot. And if there's a hundred homes in the homeowner association and they're all abiding by that scheme, that's perfectly legitimate. And the quorum rule says that 
no two board members, for example, could show up to a meeting, even though the public's there complaining because these two board members want to paint all the homes sky blue or dark blue with white trim. And the homeowners could, you know, completely be against that proposition. But because there's a majority of two, not a super majority or a three fifths majority or whatever, that small bit of managers could change the rules on the fly. And so the quorum requirement says you cannot do that without a majority of board members present. That's the same rule in the Oregon Senate. The Oregon Senate requires 20 members to be in the floor chamber and speaking to the issues at hand. And if there are not 20 persons there on the Senate floor, then you cannot conduct business, i.e. you cannot pass a rule that says we're going to paint everything sky blue. And that's all we did. Uh, Republicans have used the quorum uh, denial effort. Democrats have used it in the past. An independent party member used it originally to instill the core, the um, the uh, requirement for um, uh, initiative process. And so this is a common tool, and it's a it's a constitutional tool to support the minority party. In other words, those individuals who happen not to be present during this board meeting. And so that's simply the tool we used. And we made it on, um, on uh, constitutional grounds. There's another rule, Senate Rule 1302, which says all bill summaries must comply with ORS 171.134. That's an Oregon revised statute that says the readability test for all legislative digests and summaries must meet the Fleischmann readability scale equivalent or a comparable of 60, which is a middle school, high school grade level readability score. Most of the scores, uh, less than 10% met that readability score. So most 90% of the scores that we ranked were illegal based on this rule. And based on their illegality, we denied quorum. And so denying quorum is a perfectly legitimate tool to use now that the Supreme Court, you know, wasn't paying attention to those aspects of our complaint is, uh, is you know, you know, our, our, um, our problem with communicating that idea clearly to the Supreme Court, they ruled that the state has the right to regulate, quote unquote, regulate your attendance. They were not paying attention to the idea of regulating the majority by having this ability to deny quorum to the minority party. So this is one of those unintended consequences that is deadly. This is like throwing chum to shark infested waters. Whatever comes out of the deep will come out of the deep when you least expect it. And this is really a dangerous precedent for the future. If Republicans or independents or the Constitutional Party or the Green Party get in power and can abuse this rule, they will or potentially they will, because the irony is whereas um, the Constitution was the lines on the basketball court to define where inbounds is and where out of bounds is. The irony is that these the primary object of government has been um, for the ambitious and designing individuals within the government organization itself to take over the uh, control of government um, tools and offices. This so, is and, why I'm running for Secretary of State. So, and, and you know, I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I understand the position that you've taken. However, um, Measure 113, which limited, uh, or which said that, that legislators who had 10 walkout days, uh, or unexcused absences, I should say, um, couldn't run for re-election. Um, that was, uh, Every county but two in the state um, endorsed that ballot measure, um, including Klamath County. Um, and so 
I guess, you know, the question arises, can voters trust that you will you will respect the law, even if you object to it, even if you want to challenge it in court, that you um, will will respect it? Well, yeah, of, of course they can. First of all, there is no legislative uh, quorum requirement for the Secretary of State. What you're describing is simply is no different than um, a batter. In, he's in the batter's box, three strikes, he's out and he moves to the side. He's no longer at bat. That's what happened with the Supreme Court. Sorry, Senator Linthicum, you're no longer allowed in the batter's box. Please head to the dugout. And we did. I'm no longer running for that office. It's perfectly legitimate. This isn't illegal. The, the, the Measure 113 did not say you cannot deny quorum. They just simply said if you deny quorum more, more than 10 times, you strike out. So I'm in the batter's box. I give it my 10 tries. And we did bring the majority party into negotiations. They gave up several things that they were not willing to deny or to negotiate on earlier. And I simply moved to the dugout. There's nothing illegitimate about that or disrespectful about that. Batters strike out all the time and come back again on another day in another inning. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about just kind of the role of the Secretary of State. Um, can you uh, t tell us, for instance, on, uh, you know, you would serve as the top elections official for uh, for Oregon. What would be your priorities uh, regarding elections? Well, I, I think uh, election integrity is an extremely big issue, um, as can be seen on the Secretary of State's webpage uh, the Secretary of State claims to have a desire and a pledge to focus on integrity grounded in transparency, accountability, and fairness. And I would follow up and stress all three of those ideas as important for improving the aspects of integrity through transparency and openness. As an illustration, I participated in a 2022 request for ballot images from Jackson County that's one of the districts within my, or uh, one of the counties within my Senate district. And uh, these images are by law kept for two years and available for public perusal. So th this is an interesting point. The county clerk responded with a cost estimate of $982,000, uh, $900, Let's let me read it right. Nine hundred eighty-two thousand eight hundred ninety-six dollars and seventeen cents. That's the level of accuracy from the clerk's office. Dot seventeen cents. And this is not illustrative of a system that's transparent, fair, or accountable, because the citizens have been, you know, kept from accessing these publicly available records. And they'll never get their hands on this. And so this million dollar fee, $982,000, as a, coming from a rule of the Secretary of State deserves a thorough review. I think this rule is wrongheaded. I will do my best to overturn it or undo it or um, rescind it however possible because the public has been denied access to information that they rightly own. I think the public should especially be able to audit their own precinct where they live as well as their county data and um, this information ought to be widely available and as elections, uh, as the chief elections officer, I would pursue those ends. Do you have any concern? Well, do you have any concerns that people would um, just kind of launch fishing expeditions um, as a way to uh, kind of search for uh, for something to to challenge the validity of an election? Uh, you, you you kind of broke up. Could you repeat this uh, this sure. question? I'm sorry for I I should have spoke up as soon as you were breaking, but I I thought I'd try and figure it out, but I didn't catch it. No worries. Um, and actually, it wasn't a very well worded question. But um, do you have any concerns that people would um, uh, 
file records requests or or ask to see you know every ballot image as a fishing expedition um, like do you think that there's perhaps a more efficient way of addressing any concerns um, regarding the the integrity of the election yeah you, you actually raise a good question right right now fishing expeditions are quite commonplace within the legislative body and um but but it, I, I think it's better to ask the question the other way. What happens when the, when people cannot get their hands on the information they requested? For example, um, the CDC recently redacted 148 pages, complete redaction, blackout all the way through 148 pages of 148 Pfizer a trial test for a COVID vaccine. Now, what in the world did the CDC redact 148 solid pages of information? Was that all national security information? Was that health information? What relevant information was hidden behind that golden black marker? And um, I think what happens in that case, for example, the million dollar price price tag on uh, this small Southern County, Jackson County, medium sized anyway, people become fearful and they start looking for, if not even imagining fraudulent manipulations and their imaginations can quite frankly run wild. So I think legitimate questions that have been raised and not appropriately addressed cause more fear and, um, and quote, misinformation than information that becomes uh, publicly available at the very first moment and is widely disseminated. And there's an open-handed, transparent policy from every county clerk in the state. Some counties are little teeny counties, 2,000 people or fewer, um, 7,000 persons in, uh, in um, uh, Lake County and 12,000 persons in Crook County. These counties shouldn't have any problem delivering that information. It's all electronically available. It'll fit on a thumb drive. It won't cost but a buck 50 per thumb drive. You could force people to bring in their own buck 50 worth of thumb drive. And um, disseminating this information on a web server would be easier still. So I don't see any problems with that, but I think hiding the information behind a cloak in the illustration with the 148 Pfizer trial document, 148 pages of hidden data causes everybody to ask, wait, what in the world is going on here? And that's a terrible place for the government offices to find themselves in. I, I think there's a tension here because certainly ballots are are submitted secretly. They are the idea that that um, that is your personal private um, expression of how you want to vote is something that has to be protected by county officials. Um, you know, the uh, I, I, so I guess I'm wondering, like, you know, does that does that concern kind of um, would you would you account for that concern in any way just to like find a different way of of assuring people about the integrity of an election, um, you know, other than having everyone be able to view ballot images. Well, the, 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 you raise an interesting point, and that's why the Secretary of State made the rule she made, but it's farcical. The Secretary of State's rule is to have human eyes, in other words, AI can't do it, so you have to have human intelligence. We're still the smartest people on the planet, have human intelligence review front and back of every ballot image, quote, looking for personal information. And first of all, the ballot has no personal information on it. The envelope had a barcode that related to you, and that gets scanned. The ballot gets separated from the security envelope. The security envelope goes one way, the ballot goes another way. 
And actually, the Secretary of State today has no idea how any one of us voted. You could call them up, call up your elections uh, chief uh, county officer, the uh, county clerk, and ask, did I vote in the last presidential election? They will tell you yes or no. Then you could ask, who did I vote for? They'll say, I don't know, because they have no idea. Now, if they don't know and they cannot determine that answer, then certainly somebody uh, uh, with a laptop on the internet can't determine that either. And so the Secretary of State's ruling is farcical and needs to be unwound. Okay, thank you. Um, let me ask about the campaign finance bill that uh, the legislature passed. Um, what is your experience implementing a complicated program? And do you have any particular thoughts about just um, you know, whether there are aspects of that bill that will need to be changed. The, the, there, there may be aspects of it that need to be changed. I um, I have extensive background in this. As I mentioned, I was a senior vice president for management information systems, a division within a large insurance company, and we were implementing uh, you know, software to manage uh, assets, not only information assets, but physical assets and collateral that the company owned and, you know, generated dividends off of and whatnot. So there's an entire menagerie of interfaces that are required for um, implementing large scale projects, understanding them, managing the data collection process, which is often the hardest part, validating the information coming into the system, collecting it, analyzing it, and categorizing it, and then presenting um, dashboards, if you will, or management tools so that any candidate or any um, political action committee or any citizen, the constituents at large, can see that data, ask questions of that data, interrogate that data, and navigate through the dashboard as an interface. I was a GUI specialist, a graphical user interface specialist um, in, in one of my jobs where I was managing the information to present it to the individuals at the data entry terminals so that they got it right. They only had the certain validated choices. They couldn't type anything in and mess up the data. And they followed the rules that were implemented via the software design. So I bring a, an extensive uh, IS or information system perspective to managing and implementing these large scale systems. I hope that helps um, with regard to uh, the issue that uh, people are wondering about uh, today and um, and in in my position as Secretary of State. And can you tell me, um, you, you know, um, in 2020, um, you participated or you, you were one of the signers of a letter to Ellen Rosenblum asking her to um, join a lawsuit filed, I believe, by Texas against uh, for the states regarding their certification of results. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about just your stance on the, the 2020 election? Uh, the, well, we again, this was seeking answers kind of question. So um, if you're if you have questions and and they're legitimate questions, we negotiated our questions with um, uh, because we started late. People are asking me, um, you know, what, am I ready for the next meeting? And I'm oh, trying sorry. to tell them with my left hand that I'm not ready yet. Um, back back to the 2020 election, we, we were simply looking for answers and asking questions. And quite frankly, I think the um, the. Secretary of State's office did not uh, give us the time of day and um, did not um, care uh, about our concerns. That's a mistake. The Secretary of uh, State's office needs to care. They need to have empathy. There's a lot of concerns out there. There are concerns from the far left all the way through the middle ground, all the way to the far right. The Secretary of State's office 
office more than any other office needs to be able to show that they understand the issues and they have legitimate responses to those questions. Instead, we were essentially denied. They became the holder, the, gate, the gates of security came down around their little, little, little bunker and they became the keys uh, to knowledge and information. If, read a children's fairy tale. The, the guy who's got the keys to knowledge and power holds those like a demon and will not let them go. And the entire fairy tale that you're reading about to your grandchildren is about, or children, is about how individual people respond in the face of this kind of uh, censorship and tyranny. So I think it's perfectly appropriate for people to expect changes from the Secretary of State's office. And and do you feel that in the in, that in the years since that you have um, received information or seen anything that uh, either contradicts your your view that um, I, I guess do you do you believe now that the 2020 election was um, was fair that there wasn't mass fraud? Well, we we see the you you ask a, a keen question. I like the way you phrased it, and the 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 phrase is was it massive fraud? And the truth is, if if a detective never surveils the backyard, he'll never know how many bodies are out there. So somebody could say, oh, there's only one body in the back forty, but you don't know that until you investigate. And if you're never allowed to investigate, I'm sorry, this is private property you can't investigate here, or this is public property, this is Secretary of State's office, you don't have the rights or the authority to investigate this 40-acre parcel, you'll never know. So it's your, your guess that there's not widespread fraud is as much as my guess that there is widespread fraud. Neither of us have any factual basis or evidential stance on whether widespread or you know insignificant fraud occurs. And that's part of our complaint. Our complaint is without information, without transparency, without accountability, without good reasons, there is no reason to trust the data you're getting. For example, look at what the public went through with COVID. The pub, there was no uh, asymmetric, uh, asymptomatic transmission data, none. There's no um, six foot distance data, none. There's no um, information regarding the need for face masks in public, none. There's no information about the plexiglass requirements that went up in every grocery store. In fact, those plexiglass plates are now gone. I, you and I should have been in the plexiglass investment arena. We could have made a fortune. There's no data for any of that. And there was no data that, that told the CDC that the COVID vaccine would stop transmission or prevent your getting sick. And in truth, now we know the average age of a COVID death stamped by the local medical examiner was 83, while the average COVID, while the average non-COVID death during the same time frame was 81. So it turns out this is comorbidity harvesting by the CDC, but we can't get our hands on information like that 148 page document request that's been blacked out. This is dangerous territory that we're walking in and more and more people ought to wake up to the fact that the government is withholding valid information for, from you and from me, and we ought to have our hands on that information to make legitimate decisions. Great, okay. Well, thank you very much for the time, and I am sorry that we started late. Um, does anyone else have any questions? No? Okay, great. No, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you very much. If um, I have additional questions, uh, we will follow up in an email or phone call. But again, I'm sorry that we started late and thank you for taking the time to talk with us. No, no problem. I, I'm happy with what we recorded here. Um, I look forward to uh, you providing a link and seeing what the public thinks. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.